So good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's NAS Chat. I'm the guest, I am the host, Kari Reagan, and I am so thrilled to welcome my esteemed guest, Dr. Mike Johns from USC. He is the Director of Laryngology and Director of USC Voice Center at Keck Medicine at the University of Southern California. And Peggy Broody, of course, who is well known to NAS members. Um, and is widely recognized as one of today's leading experts in the field of clinical singing voice rehabilitation. She works alongside doc, um, Dr. Robert Satellite Loth in Philadelphia at the Voice Clinic. So welcome both of you. Thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you, sorry. There's, it's such a hot topic, and I know that this summer when you both presented um, in one of the early sessions on aging voice, it was the, the buzz, the entire conference. It was really so popular. So I'm thrilled and grateful that you'll be here tonight with us. Let's jump right in. There's so much to cover. So Dr. Johns, why don't you lead us off a little and, and tell us as singers and teachers of singing, what is it from the medical field that you think we should know? Yeah, no, thank you very much, Kari. I appreciate it. I want to thank Nats. I want to thank the Voice Foundation, for, Peggy, for including me, number one. And for two, how cool is this format that we can be here in the comfort of our homes, our cars, or wherever, and interact with each other? I think it's absolutely awesome. So it's exciting. It is. Um, aging voice. First things first, I want to tell everyone the number one principle in geriatric medicine and gerontology is this aging is not a disease it's something that happens it's something that's viewed as a disease in the medical community but it's not and we it's inevitable we all age we're all getting older things happen some may be based in nature some may be based in nurture hope to hear some questions about that um, but at the end of the day we're all getting older, and, um, and it's not a disease, number one. The second thing I want to express right off the bat is um, some things, as we get older, some things get a little bit saggy, some things get a little bit stiff. We lose a little bit of coordination in some of the things that we do, and it takes effort and work to maintain our performance. Um, the, the good news consequence of that is that certain things don't happen. Nodules, polyps, mm. cysts, phonotrauma, we don't see that in our aging performers. And that has big implications for how we take care of our voices and how we rehabilitate voice and how we maximize voice in our older years. I love that. So the, you, you see it somewhat hopeful, I presume, <laughs> that we just have to ebb and flow with the aging and there are, that you take the good with the bad. Well, I think we've got to think about voice a little bit differently than when we're in our 20s and 30s and when we're in our 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and hopefully 90s. Well, Peggy, so from the, the world of the singing voice specialist, um, Talk to me a little bit about what, what your approach is and what considerations that you give to the singers. Sure. Well, I would speak as a singing voice specialist and also as a private teacher. I don't consider myself an expert in the aging voice, but like a lot of the teachers in the audience tonight who's, who are listening, I've certainly formed certain ideas, and there are a couple of them I'd like to present right at the onset. And one is something that I'm sure Mike will talk about, and that is that the body begins the aging process at a very young age. The negative effects of aging start earlier than we'd like to think about it. So tonight as we talk about the aging voice, I'm thinking more fifth decade and beyond, mm -hmm. uh, where, where I begin to see, and most of us begin to see, uh, consistently across the singing population more issues. I think it's also important to remember, and we all know this, that people age at different rates and in different ways. You look at a video of Lucina Mara at 65, sounding fabulous, and then Joan Sutherland in her late 50s really struggling. Two great singers. I personally think that all things being equal, uh, between singers, technique, physical health, and so forth, that um, our genetic makeup may be one of the biggest determiners of how our voice ages. 
I think also I'd like to mention the idea of use it or lose it, that popular axiom that we hear all the time. I think for voice, a more realistic view for anyone, professional, avocational singer, is uh, use it and lose it less quickly. And I like that attitude because, because I think it's important to be realistic. I think it's more beneficial to us as singers to, to remain realistic. We can either accept, adapt, and stay marketable as singers at whatever level we are, or we can deny, we can try to keep a status quo, and we can become less marketable. So I think the understanding that the voice is going to change and that we have to accommodate those changes is very, very important. And with that in mind, the general approach I take to aging and to people who are dealing with their voice as it ages is I think it's important to maintain optimum general health. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to follow a protocol of vocal exercises, including repertoire, on a regular basis, and I also think it's very important to develop a whole tool book of strategies to work around the inevitable problems that conditioning and good health can't correct for. I'd also like to just say that we need to remember that singing is about communication. Experienced singers, whether they're professionals or avocation or semi-professionals, develop a level of artistry over a lifetime. And this enables the singer to convey the meaning of the music and move the hearts of the audience, even after the voice begins to show signs of aging. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also very important to remember. Mm -hmm. One of the things I, I loved about your paper that you presented this summer was, and I've now dubbed it the three Gs, genre, gender, and genes. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, <laughs> Well, that it's yours. I've I've stolen it from you. So, <laughs> but I and there was more than that. But those were certainly three that that stood out to me. Um, and I especially, with um, all due respect to Dr. Johns, I especially loved the the gender um, humor in it. Um, Don't even get me started on that. <laughs> when, women, when women go through the Armageddon of menopause. <laughs> And then you hear men fussing about a little loss of testosterone. I mean, oh, it's not even comparable. That's, that's, that's a great segue, Peggy, to one of my most important questions that I want Dr. Johns to address um, is let, hormones. We, is, uh, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about that, but let me lead off with my one question. Sure. So I know that the laryngologists really discourage um, well, I shouldn't say that. I my experience is that that some discourage testosterone for women. Um, my question to you, though, is if we're keeping our testosterone at a biological norm or bringing it back to the biological norm, why would we be concerned about that? Yeah, it's a great question. And with testosterone in women, you've got to be extremely careful. Dosing of testosterone is a challenge, whether it's topicals, oral therapy, but the bottom line is this. When women are exposed to exogenous testosterone, the larynx undergoes a permanent puberty. Okay. And you get a deepening of the voice, you get an enlargement of the larynx, and it's irreversible. So I typically don't recommend any testosterone whatsoever for women who are, are singers. Really? And whether very low doses may not create that pu pubertal effect, um, it's just very unfortunate when I see a singer who has been performing well, takes testosterone exogenously and has a permanent virilization of the voice and just can't do what they could do before. And it's per it's not like you can come back off and, and the right. voice returns to normal is my understanding. Sure. Just so, like when, when I was 13 and 14, my voice is cracking. Okay. And is that what you have heard singers, uh, I mean, have you experienced a female in their 50s or 60s taking a small dose of testosterone who is suddenly having some singing issues that you have 
Yeah, I've seen that multiple times. Again, dose-related phenomenon, likely, and okay. that's, the, that's the piece that we don't know. But if you're giving therapeutic doses of testosterone, you're going to have a periodization of the voice. It's dangerous. Okay. Been, and how do they dangerous. present? They present with cracking. They present with lowering of tessitura. Deepening of pitch, pitch ceilings, mm -hmm. difficulties in vocal transitions. And Peggy, is that your experience as well? Absolutely. I would weigh in and say it is not worth the risk. It okay. is really not worth the risk. And again, because not everybody... Oh, sorry. No, no, I was just going to say because everybody's biology is different. You're, everybody's body is different. The dosing is going to be tremendously variable. It is really not worth the risk. Women I've seen have been impacted by shifts in testosterone. It's, it's disastrous. Okay. Very interesting. Now, for men, you know, we don't, the answer's not out there. So, and there's a lot of attention to testosterone in men, largely related to sort of muscular bulk and virility. But obviously, at the end of the day, the larynx is a set of muscles, ligaments, and mucosa. And could there be some potential benefit to testosterone in men? Hard to know. Mm -hmm. um, men in aging, we see more thinning of the vocal folds, in general, loss of muscle mass. And women, we see the tendency to lose tone and tension and more at least perceived thickening of the vocal folds, at least on our rudimentary laryn laryngeal endoscopies. Um, so could men benefit from testosterone? Unknown. That's an experiment I would not be afraid to try, however. Okay. Well, let's stick with hormones for a second and talk about progesterone and estrogen. And a couple questions, um, even unrelated to the aging boys. What is it that happens in the female cycle when estrogen drops? And, of course, in the aging voice when it drops more permanently. So let's talk about that for a minute. Go ahead. Dr. John's from the medical community first. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. It's, it's in... We know what happens sort of biologically with loss of estrogen production, loss of cycling, but what happens in the voice I found to be really quite variable. Some people re report dramatic changes through menopause. Some individuals report not that much. Some people report improvement on hormone replacement therapy. Some people don't report a lot as well. And so there's a lot we don't know about what happens in the voice through menopause and those hormonal um, changes that happen. You know, when, when I see individuals who are going through menopause and have voice changes, my recommendation to them is to identify an OBGYN, OBGYN doctor who's willing to experiment a little bit. There's pros and cons of taking hormone replacement therapy um, in terms of a variety of risks, cardiac and others. But the bottom line is voice is important. And for individuals where that's a priority, our decision making in medicine is all about risks and benefits. And if you find, identify someone who's not necessarily going to live by the exact protocols of medical therapy and may work with you as an individual to try to optimize your situation, a little experimentation is in order. Interesting. Peggy, from your end, what would you share with us about that, about the hormone? I would agree with Mike that women um, experience menopause, the actual period of menopause, differently. Some women have dramatic vocal shifts during and, and shortly after menopause. Some don't notice it. In the end, all women are affected by that hormonal shift. The effect will come. It's just when it comes. Does it come right away during menopause or does it happen later? Um, the one my position is, and I'm echoing Dr. Sadiloff, but if there are no general health risk factors for you, as Mike was saying earlier, I'm a b big believer in taking hormone replacement therapy. I think you ought to do it if you're a serious singer, if there are no counterindications. And do you uh, have an opinion, and this may be out of your scope, but just from a personal experience or personal being at the clinic, the bioidenticals versus the synthetic, the estrogen patch, or do you have an opinion on those choices? Can't answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody has. M Mike, do you? Yeah, I, I would say measure hormone levels and replace on a medical level. I mean, try you know natural remedies. No, nothing wrong with trying them on your own. But you know, if there's 
if you can measure it and replace it, why not? Mm -hmm. And how about we had Dr. Abhipal on uh, last spring? He um, and we're the, he, you know he's got a book coming out. It, um, but he also talked about taking hyaluronic acid pills, and he talked about collagen pills. There were four things, Peggy, and those are the only two I can remember: hyaluronic acid, mm -hmm. uh, collagen, the magnesium. Would that have been the third? It could have and, been, but I don't remember the four. I don't either. Um, and we lost that Nats chat. But anyway, Dr. Johns, do you have any opinions about that kind of? <laughs> yeah. So um, my philosophy in general with, a lot, with regards to supplements is if it doesn't hurt, right. no problem. May not help. Things we put in our mouth don't necessarily get to our target tissues. Right. And so taking hyaluronic acids not, likely won't plump up my true vocal folds, but it's probably not going to hurt either. <laughs> so I say take it and try it, and whether it's a real effect or a placebo effect, an effect right. is an effect. Right, and for singers, that's important, that placebo effect. And I think the, the problem maybe, is the problem we face in general with supplements. It's just there's, no, there's not a lot of hard data, you know, not a lot of real scientific uh, method research on it, so we can't say definitively one way or the other. You think it's, a challenge, it's a challenge to study. There's there's really limited funding to do these okay. kind of studies. That being said, we're starting a study on B12. So anybody on the on the ball who's a NAS, we're going to be reaching out to people about um, B12 and where oh, uh, to come on that. Oh, that's what are you fantastic. thinking about? Wait a minute. What are you thinking about B12? What's the correlation? Um, people like the B12 for their overall vitality. Right. And some singers will swear to the fact that it improves their voice, their, vo their ease of their voice, their vocal vitality. And so we're going to study it in two, in two dimensions. One's going to be a survey study just to get a sense of what people perceive about it. And then we're going to do a um, actual clinical trial of B12 at some objective outcome measures for voice. Great. So more to come on the NATS um, um, listservs. We're looking for subjects. Let's move on. Oh, oh, that's great. So, um, Nats Chatters, I would, I am shocked that I'm not. There we go. There's a question, but please, more questions. We, this is your chat. Um, somebody asks, are you familiar with? Uh, sorry, Weba. Um, are you familiar with NAC? Capital N, capital A, capital C. Can you give us more, Weba? I'm, I uh, do not. We are. Apparently not, <laughs> um, based on that. that uh, but if it's got a knack for the voice, it's got to be good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here she says, um, N-acetylcysteine. I'm sorry if I'm... Yeah, so N-acetylcysteine is a medication that we can deliver via IV medication or we can inhale it, and it's a mucolytic. And so wow. inhaled N-acetylcysteine is a great mucolytic, um, but it's a mucolytic. So what it's going to do for the tissues otherwise, hard to know. But it does really work well for, for that, that particular, particular task. So we use that in a lot of our airway patients where we're worried about mucus clots and things in the airway to obstruct the breathing as a mucolytic, meaning breaking up the mucus. So why wouldn't that be helpful? In the aging voice, it probably is because one thing that happens as we get older is we lose productivity of our let our our mucus glands all over our salivary glands, but particularly at the at the level just below the vocal folds, which is the primary source of mucus for vocal fold vibration. So, hey, I'm not saying no. Interesting. Um, by the way, Barbara DeMaio is on, who of course wrote her dissertation on the elite aging voice, and she says in Europe it is common to receive a shot of B12 before a performance. Correct. Yeah. So, I wanted to share that. Oh, good. Lots of questions coming in, so we'll start moving through. Um, David asks, what is causing reflux in the aging voice, and what natural treatments have you found? Um, so as reflux, I will say first and foremost um, is number one overdiagnosed in voice disorders, hands down. Period. Um, as reflux affects the throat, affects the larynx. Um, if it is not, if it's 
it has to be incredibly severe for you to be aspirating acid contents to the point where it touches the vocal folds, right? Because nothing touches the vocal folds in a healthy situation. Um, but as we get older, acid reflux is more common. Why? Because we lose muscular tone and tension or our esophageal sphincters, number one. And two, the medications that we take, a lot of the medications for hypertension and whatnot cause relaxation of those muscles. And so you can have more reflux. Um, from a treatment standpoint, my goal in general is to start with a firm diagnosis and particularly pertain, as it pertains to the sound source, number one. And then number two, for homeopathic remedies for acid reflux, it's all about alginate. And alginate is a, uh, it's from seaweed, largely derived from seaweed, creates a raft on the stomach. And you can buy this in various forms. Um, Gaviscon Advance is one that has a, a large quantity of alginate for those who are looking for homeopathic remedies for acid reflux. But again, I don't ascribe a lot of changes at the sound source itself, meaning the vocal cord vibration and the health of the two vocal folds to acid reflux. Really? That's a little revelatory, you know. I mean, it's, uh, you know, and I know you guys have been doing a lot of the reflux webinars um, lately, and we've had guests on, but, um, and I know it's quite controversial, but that, that's very interesting. So do you, when you see redness, do you then not suggest people put themselves on a PPI as a general rule? Well, I will tell you, in, particularly in men, where we're dealing with thinning of the body of the vocal fold, thinning of the lamina appropriate of the vocal fold, a little bit of edema goes a long way. One thing that's fascinating, when we see our, um, our aging voice patients who've got that thin quality of their voice, breathiness, patients will tell me when they get a cold, when they get a, a, a minor acute laryngitis, their voice becomes rich and robust. Why? Because vocal fold edema. So I don't chase reflux down all that hard in uh, when we're dealing with glottal insufficiency. Mm -hmm. Peggy, would you like to? Well, I work for, you know, Dr. Reflux. Dr. Sadloff's a big um, <laughs> believer in the presence and impact of reflux. Um, and he, we use, a, um, Mike, do y'all do 24-hour pH monitors or you don't? We do do that, yes. Um, I'm just curious how you finalize the diagnosis. Well, we can talk about that later, but what I would say is that from a clinical standpoint in working with the voices, I certainly see a lot of voices improve on a reflux protocol. It doesn't always happen that way, but there, I wasn't a believer when I came into the practice, but having seen what I've seen, I have to say that I am. Um, I believe that, um, especially with elite singers, the least amount of inflammation or irritation on the vocal folds can be problematic, just like a tiny bit of arthritis for a concert pianist is, is problematic. So certainly at an elite level, I think it's worth treating aggressively if there's a suspicion. And I, I do believe that we see a number of older folks who have symptomatic either esophageal symptoms or laryngeal symptoms of reflux. And do I, I actually will second that. And I'll second that my construct around how reflux affects the voice is, like I said, not so much related to the sound source, but any sort of irritation in your pharynx, mm -hmm. in your pharyngeal mucosa, yep. leads to muscle tension. And as you know, any muscle tension, particularly in the, in, above the oblique line of the larynx, anything super hyoid and above, that's going to impair your ability of your cricothyroid muscles to function. From a muscle tension standpoint, I am right on board with you. Mm -hmm. And it's it's critical with high level singers. It's it's very problematic. But I I, I I understand your reticence about the whole issue, and there is a problem with the medications. Mm -hmm. I've always wondered why, when one suspects that, when the doctors suspect it, why they don't immediately do the the Bravo test or you know one of the two. Aren't there two tests that they can do wearing the probe? Yeah, so our best test is impedance pH metry, which is a catheter you wear in your nose. Okay. You wear it for 48 hours, and it comes out of your nose, and you tape it to yourself, and you wear a little pack. And it's, I've done it myself, 
it is 100% super no fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we does it give us the answer yes or no? Maybe. So reflux is this phenomenon. It's a chronic relapsing remitting disease, and so sometimes it's present, sometimes it's not. Do we capture that in 24 hours with a cath in your nose? Don't know. This is why a, the medical field relies largely on empiric trials more than you know, capturing data and capturing data when there's clinical questions after an empiric trial of medication or behavioral therapy, dietary therapy. Interesting. Well, we will not go down that reflux rabbit hole any further. Yeah, we can go, we can go a long way there. Let's, let's kill it. We can go a long way. So let me move through a couple short questions. Um, uh, Weber wanted to know about the CNA. Can you take too much? Uh, orally or inhaled? She doesn't specify. I would assume orally. That's a good question. The answer which I would recommend taking it according to physician recommendations or the label on the, on the bottle. Okay. Um, and Barbara just wanted to comment that she always felt more energetic with the B12, so I wanted to get those in before we move forward. I know. This is something that we hear, and I want to understand, is this real? Is it not real? Hence our, our, our line of investigation. My grandmother was a nurse for 60 years, and even in her late 70s, she'd give herself a B12 shot about once a month or so, and I'm telling you, she w went like a house of fire. Yeah. Really? <laughs> Sometimes I had it, I was lethargic, and I didn't equate it to the shot the first time, but the second time I did, and I thought, well, why would I do that? <laughs> I you know, lethargic. And so this is why we need to study these kind of things, you know, and that's why I'm excited about that. People laughed at me, were like, you're going to study B12, really? I'm like, yeah, I think people, it's important. I mean, this yeah, is... absolutely. And, and Tari, I want to say, yeah. you, made, you made a good uh, point there, just in general, about any medication, that singers should never try anything new immediately before a performance or in the time period before a performance because you don't know how it's going to affect you. One out of every hundred people can have a negative effect to a medication. I know it's a side issue, but as we get older, we tend to take more meds. Yes. And really avoid them right before performance. Okay. Thank you. And we're going to get to some exercise questions in a second, but let's push through a few more more medical for a moment. Um, Priscilla Bagley says, my biggest personal issue seems to be drying of my voice while singing. Any suggestions beyond all the extra hydrating? So hydrating, how so? So we think about hydrating by drinking water. So when we drink water, obviously we're not aspirating yet. And we get secondary hydration of our tissues based on absorption of the liquid in our stomach and then distribution to our extracellular space, our mucosa. But I'm going to make a big, big point to advocate for steam inhalation or yes. saline inhalation. I, would, I prefer steam, and I'll tell you why I prefer steam over saline. First of all, any sort of inhalational therapy is a, it, it's it's topical. It's getting on the tissues where you want it to go. Okay. And the reason why I like steam over saline, you read about Himalayan salts and all of this sort of thing, which sounds like very fun and they're very very beautiful. But steam, the there's no salt in it, and your body contains a lot of salt. And so when you're when your tissues that have no, a liquid that's low in salt is exposed to a tissue that's high in salt, the water is going to go towards the salt. And that's how, that's how chemistry works. And so that's why I like steam, because it's going to absorb right into the tissues. And it's just incredibly help, helpful. And there's scientific studies to, to support that. And Mike, you're not saying instead of orally hydrating, you're saying additional. Both and. Both and. Um, and Barbara would like us to know that while she was doing her research on dissertation that she, um, this is from an earlier conversation, she could not find any research that said bioidenticals were better. So I find that very fascinating, Barbara. Thank you for sharing that. That has been a big question. Now our darling Cynthia Vaughn says um, at 59, uh, she continues to sing a lot. She's having a grand time playing older character roles former high coloratura, I'm enjoying my slightly lower range and rich timbre, it's a win. And Peggy, you address that in your paper too, it's one of the, that adapt idea. It's the whole idea of having a whole 
a host of tools, of strategies to accommodate the vocal changes that are going to occur. Certainly change of fa, um, change of tempo, change of keys, there's so many considerations. Um, as singers get older, sometimes their endurance changes. They have to figure out different routines for themselves, for professionals. How many performances can I do in a week? I used to could do four or five. Now I can do two comfortably. How much downtime do I, do I need? All of these things can be taken into consideration. The tempi of pieces. I mean, these are just the common sense things that I'm sure everybody thinks about. But there are a million strategies that you can use um, to adjust to the changes and still remain an effective communicator and artist. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, and part of that, you know, if I can second that, yes. to highlight my, the first message, aging is not a disease, it's not. And things change and we're beautiful and we things we have different ways of communicating things aren't going to remain exactly the same and it's okay you know find it and love it and that's why i love that comment yeah that's great thank you cynthia now, this is interesting we're going to go just for one moment back to reflex somebody wants to know um have you ever heard that raw habanero peppers have been effective in treating reflex absolutely not <laughs> Raw habanero peppers are going to burn your throat, it's going to burn your stomach, it's going to burn your esophagus. Thank you, my <laughs> messenger here. <laughs> I had to read it, though. And I love me some hot stuff. Don't get me wrong. That's probably not going to help any mucous membrane tissue. Mm -mm -mm. Unless maybe this really, you're really atrophic and you're going to burn things up in some edema. I don't know. But it's not going on your vocal cords. So probably uh, it's still a no. And the problem, too, is having a definitive reflux diagnosis. Uh, th there are too many things that present, as Mike well knows, with similar symptoms. And often singers diagnose themselves. Well, I have phlegm and morning voice. It takes me a long time to warm up, and I'm fuzzy and blah, 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 so I must have reflux. That's not, that's not good because there are many things that cause similar symptoms. So if you think you have reflux, if you feel convinced about it, see a specialist, get the gold standard test at least, and try to find out if you do. Take a 24-hour pH monitor and, and find as, out if you have As it. we're learning more and more about the complications of our best treatment for acid reflux, which is acid suppression therapy with what's called a proton pump inhibitor, things like omeprazole, Nexium is a brand name, Ezomeprazole, all the other ones in the family. Um, I try not to prescribe that unless we have a definitive diagnosis. That's so Maybe women, heart disease, it's a whole bunch of, you know, potentially stroke is the latest complication reported with PPIs. Well, one of the things that we do is we recommend just a strict 8 to 12 week course of medication and anti-reflux behavior to see if there's a change. And if there is, then figure out maybe how to titrate off the meds or find another way to control it. Because with elite singers, time is everything. Yep. I mean, it's, it's problematic. And I personally think people are more vulnerable to injury for multiple reasons right. if they have irritation on their larynx, whether it's from allergies or reflux or whatever. And the so, team that I work with that as well. Say that so, again? I was just saying that the, 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 the team, voice teams that I work on too, because I work it with different clinics, and it's, it's kind of used as a diagnosis as well, that same pattern that you describe. But Mike so, is right. There's a real problem with long-term use of PPIs, so we're uh, struggling with figuring it out. Okay, enough about reflux. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Well, yeah, yeah, we'll go forward. All right. Um, I love that. Thank you. Get us out of that rabbit hole, Peggy. Um, yeah. So Barbara Wilson says, the comment about the loss of production in the mu mucus glands below the vocal folds is interesting. Is this one reason so many older people seem to experience persistent mucus? Is there anything that can be done to relieve that? Yeah, so good question. Yes is the answer. A lot of the, <clears throat> so mucus is healthy. It's the oil in the engine. We want our, our mucus to be healthy. We want it to be thin 
and it's going to allow our tissues to function well, vibrate well at the vocal fold level. So how do we fight the body's natural tendency over the years to create thicker mucus and less? So hydration, steam. I have never tried, there's medications that will, in, in, will enhance salivary gland function. I've never tried that electively. I've only tried it in my cancer patients, but it is effective in our cancer patients, things like Salogen. There's medications you can take for that. Guaifenesin is a mucolytic. That is something that I think helps a lot of people, and there's like zero downside to taking guaifenesin. There's like no side effects whatsoever. Um, but you can't do it without supporting hydration, both systemically by water and by steam. The downside of systemic hydration, of course, is guess what? We got to pee a lot. So as long as you're willing to accept you're going to pee clear, you're going to pee a lot, you know you're doing the right thing. And as people get older, just speaking in the sixth, seventh decade, sometimes sooner, problems with incontinence can occur, and that <laughs> it dissuades people from super hydrating, especially the non-professional or semi-professional singer, but it doesn't change the need for that hydration. So there's right. often a dilemma, and we don't have to go into detail about the drugs that people take for that, but it, it can be problematic with drying in general. I mean, we, we don't have time to, Mike can tell you, we don't have time to talk about the interaction of the problem with some of the drugs we take as we get older. Yeah. All right, we're going to move into a progesterone question. I used injections when I struggled with infertility, and it didn't negatively affect my voice at the time. My daughter is a singer who has PCOS and may possibly need progesterone if she can't get pregnant. Any alternatives you advise, or is she okay vocally since the progesterone administration is only temporary? All right, we're getting into um, some material that is in the bit of the unknown territory, okay. and that's totally a-okay. Um, in these situations, um, for estrogen and progesterone, there is no long-term downside to taking those medications on the larynx. There's no permanent effects. We see this through menstruation. Hagi Shofu, my fellow, did a very nice study about what happens to the vocal folds during menstruation and their temporary changes. So if we can use that as a surrogate, I would say let's focus on the priorities at hand, which is taking care of a medical problem, looking towards life goals of pregnancy and whatnot, obviously preserving voice, but I certainly would not discourage anyone from taking medical therapy that's indicated for other goals, particularly with those medications, because it's not going to permanently impair the voice. Maybe help. The answer is we don't know. I would agree with Mike. I would say, though, experientially, I've worked with three high-level singers who've gone through intensive infertility treatment and have experienced some difficulty with range, particularly the upper. I don't feel now that it has been permanent, but it was problematic. Now, who knows what it was related to, but I'm s there could certainly be a connection. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, that with progesterone during, men during menstruation, right, or premenstrual time where the vocal fold mucosa gets thicker and you lose top right. end. Yeah, exactly. am, I, am I wrong here? Mm hmm exactly. All right, we're going to venture back out of uh, hormones. Um, and actually, I love this. Cynthia Vaughn says, <laughs> and this will be on Facebook, Mike, so just be prepared. Uh, uh, Mike Johns is crazy. The quote of the evening, Mike Johns, I love me some hot stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia, for that tonight. I was laughing at that as well, so I'm glad someone else caught that. <laughs> Martha Howe would like to, or no, sorry, Martha, hang on. I wanted to ask, there was, um, oh, gosh. Hey, Martha, that chapter's coming. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, let, let's stick with Martha's question for a minute. There was a great pulmonary question, but I lost it. Um, what about the relationship with the normal speaking voice? What are things that would help both actors and the speaking, uh, and the speaking the older person does all day? You want to jump in? You want me to go? Uh, well, um, I think there are a couple of things that can be done. I, I certainly think that working 
the speaking voice is its own entity. I do not believe that singing teachers are specifically trained to work with that. And I use um, uh, speech therapists who are specialists in voice to work with singers, and I do it all the time, and I get great results. I think, I think the results is tremendous, rather, whether it's a younger singer or an older singer. I think it is very, very helpful to do five to six sessions with a speech therapist who specializes in voice um, with specific exercises. Certainly, Joe Stemple's vocal function exercises are tremendous, useful for the speaking voice, um, useful for the singing voice, maybe for the aging singing voice, uh, but I really recommend some work with a speech therapist. I will second that. So <laughs> we, have one voice. we have one larynx, right? One larynx. Yep. One voice, right? Whether we're using speaking, whether we're using singing, it's our voice. And we spend more time speaking in general than singing, which may be a bad thing, but as a reality. Right. And I believe there's a halo effect in terms of healthy speaking function and carry over into, the, into when we sing. We use the guy one voice, so yes. And, um, and second Peggy's thoughts about appropriate therapeutic modalities for aging voice, which is not conservation, it's largely use it. You're not going to hurt yourself. Think, and, and for those who don't have access or don't have the time or transportation or don't want to pursue therapy with a speech language pathologist, which I would recommend, but if not, think loud, it will help. Think loud. Use your voice. Uh, it certainly can. The one thing I'd say about that is one of the things that we see that's problematic, Mike, is we see as people get older, sometimes their spouses and their friends uh, get hard of hearing. And so they're having to talk louder all the time. We certainly see voice problems that are directly related to too loud use of the speaking voice much of the day in an effort to speak to a par aging parent or a spouse or whomever. So I think the whole idea of using loud voice can be good, but it has to be specific. I mean, if you don't have thinning of the vocal folds or problems with glottic closure, that may not be what you need to do. And that's why I think a speech therapist is critical. And I don't like sometimes what I hear from voice teachers about you should speak high or speak with more space or that's uh, appropriate. <laughs> well, I'm not saying it's wrong for everyone. You know, those old divas spoke in that voice all the time, but it may not be right for you as an individual. So to see an expert, if you can, is a much better use of your time and money. And very often insurance will cover it if you can persuade your voice doc that you need it. Absolutely. And that's also recommended in the present Otolaryngology Academy guidelines is advocating for voice therapy. And that, and largely it's insurance supported. It's way less expensive than any medical treatment that I can offer. And I will say number two, two, way more effective. Let's stick with it. Go ahead, Peggy. Sorry. Well, because also as singers, um, as we get older, we, we, when we speak, we speak just instinctively without thinking about technique. As your body ages, those instinctive strengths that you've relied upon are getting weaker. If you're not thinking technique every minute, you're going to be using your voice less, your speaking voice less and less well. Whereas with singing, we're always thinking about technique. Yeah. So we've got a better shot of maintaining our singing voice just because we're so technique conscious. The problem with the speaking voice is that we aren't, and aging and the effects of aging really impacts how we unconsciously make those sounds. So that's where we need to begin to think a little more about technique and, and use of the voice. That's all. Sorry. I will say that. Voice starts in the speaking voice. That's where we use it all the time. Yeah. And let's stick with this exercise question. Um, and, you know, I'm so mindful of the time as all these questions are coming in. But um, And this one could take, again, the entire hour like reflux. Um, and, but Peggy, you talked a lot specifically about exercises. There are no prescriptive exercises. But what would you advise someone in that lose it less quickly idea? Is right. Um, I have a couple of quick thoughts on that. With with high level, busy professional singers, chances are that individual is using their voice enough 
already on a daily, weekly basis for strengthening and general conditioning. Mm -hmm. uh, for the avocational singer or the semi-professional singer who is not by who is not required to sing that much, you really need to keep yourself, in my opinion, on a four to five day a week schedule of some type of vocal exercises, 10 to 15 minutes, and repertoire. Exercises are not enough, in my opinion, to stave off or to slow down the impact of aging. You have got to do exercises and you've got to do rep as well. With regard to the exercises, my personal feeling is a whole host of areas should be covered. Always with good technique, you should look at um, 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 agility exercises, sustaining exercises, exercise every part of the voice. I don't feel one size fits all. I don't think there's one exercise that makes every voice better as we age. I don't think it's that. I think it's a very general approach covering all the major areas that you've always covered, but doing it on a very regular basis and absolutely singing repertoire. And that speaks to preserving neuromuscular agility. Exactly. So there's tissue changes that are happening, but right. what really largely drives our voice is right up here. And mm -hmm. here, of course, in our ears. But it's the neuromuscular agility that really needs to be preserved as well. Look at, look at any other professional athlete. And Arnold Palmer, when he teed off last year at the Masters, still can hit a golf ball better than me, but not as good as, what, 20 years ago? But hey, at 80 years old or however old he is, why can't he do it better than me? Why? Because he preserved that neuromuscular agility. Interesting. Right. More, much more so than strength. And there are a lot of singers, older singers, who swear by agility exercises, really moving the voice, trying to keep that facility. Uh, that's an important part of it. Certainly closure exercises, semi-occluded, Vs especially, something that's a little more aggressively difficult. The other thing I would say is as the vocal folds lose uh, bulk and strength and neuromuscular acuity, what we have to remember is that it's a three-part system. When the vocal folds begin to lose their grip a little bit, you've still got an acoustic component and you've got a pulmonary component, a respiratory component. So adjustments in those areas can sometimes help mitigate or, or, or at least smooth out or, or, or help with some of the problems that you're experiencing from a laryngeal standpoint. Certainly the change in the, a lot of singers know this, just change the shape of the acoustic to get a better core resonance. There's a lot of people who use narrowing, more vertical shape, more closed vowels, especially one of the big problems that women have is, uh, especially classical singers, as opposed to people who use a lot of chest voice through the middle, is that mix, that head-chest mix that classical singers, females, have to have between middle C and C above. That becomes a, a treacherous area. And so there's a lot of strategi strategizing that can be done, a lot of acoustic um, changes that can be made, um, decreasing breath pressure at specific areas of transition can be helpful. There are all types of strategies you can use to accommodate. And also just going through your music and deciding where you're going to make that switch for women between a chest dominant and a head dominant sound in that middle down into that lower. Well, thank you for bringing up the pulmonary function because that is a great segue. Cindy Dewey asks, is it common to lose pulmonary function as we age? My last pulmonary function test showed some impairment. I have been diagnosed with reflux, both types of 24-hour pH probe, and had Nissan fundoplication, sorry, on my eyes, in 2004. Could the pulmonary function loss be tied to the reflux or aging or both? So the pulmonary function, loss of, of absolute pulmonary function is associated with aging. True. Not tied to reflux whatsoever, different systems. But I will say it does not take that much pulmonary function to drive the vocal folds into healthy vibration at modal pitch, even at high pitch. The changes we see in pulmonary function with age is largely related to coordination between respiratory function, and laryngeal function. Right. So it's not about the absolutes. So it's so, uh, yeah, so. Right, I agree with Mike 100%, because when the vocal folds 
the vocal folds and the breath do this delicate balance, this delicate dance. And when the vocal folds stop processing air efficiently, it can feel like a respiratory problem. Mike, is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. But it's not. It has to do with the processing here at the level of the vocal folds. However, yeah. I would recommend that people work on, um, if not, it, do something aerobic if they can for pulmonary function. And just as important, make sure they're doing things to stretch the torso out so you have the ability for expansion and better muscular control. Overall body strength. Mm -hmm. Flexibility and cardio helps the voice. Why? Absolutely. Because the voice is a reflection of our whole body, it's a reflection of our soul, it's a reflection of our emotions. And as much as we can keep our whole body healthy and intact, the better our voice will be. Right. Um, and that someone, uh, Cindy, is referring to the conversation we had about speech, and there was a study at a European conservatory half of whom worked with speech pathologists on their speaking voice and half of whom did not. And there was some evidence that speech therapy facilitated progress in the singing voice study. So I wanted to note that. Um, and we have a question about laryngeal massage. Massage. Are you guys advocates of that? Is it something you use in your clinics? I'll go first. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. A laryngeal massage can be really, really helpful. It's not hard to learn. And not just laryngeal massage. Lita Scarce does a wonderful whole facial and neck and, and throat massage. All of that can be very, very, very useful. Um, depending on how sophisticated you can get with it. Um, I know people and good speech therapists who can get up under that, above that hyoid bone and release tension there as well. So I think it can be tremendously helpful, but it's good to learn it from an expert practitioner. I would recommend that. Mike, what do you think? I agree. So 100% wildly helpful. We manifest, manifest tensions in so many different ways, and life's getting more and more tense here, isn't it? And so, <laughs> Larry's your massage. <laughs> <laughs> Myofascial release, incredibly helpful, leads to more agility in our musculature, but do it, learn it from a trained person and someone who's willing to give you some techniques that you can bring home. Great. All right, leave it to Cynthia Vaughn to bring us back to the elephant in the room. Vibrato wobble. Wobble? That's all she said, <laughs> which vibrato we all know. Wobble. The elephant in the room is the vibrato wobble. So, Peggy, why don't you lead us with I'll say very quickly that, that um, a, a larger than makes us happy vibrato is often a symptom of aging. However, and, and that may be because of glottic closure issues, it may be neuromuscular, it may be the firmness of the vocal folds themselves, a whole host of, of physiologic mechanical reasons. But one of the things I always do with older singers who come in with a wobble is I look very carefully at compensatory tension. Oftentimes, because you see that same wobble in young singers or a similar wobble in young singers who are trying to sound older than they should, and it's from inappropriate tension. So one of the things we have to do is to look at the tension element. Once that's off the table, then what I can tell you is that the more regularly you sing on a daily basis, the more you can help stave that off. And, the, and I find with older singers, 50 and 60 and above, the longer break you take yes. in your singing, if you take a week or two weeks or three weeks off and then you come back, you got to fight that wobble until you get back in the groove again and things are a little better conditioned. It becomes more problematic to control, so you have to be more consistent with your practice. Yes. But I should look at tension issues. You better look at the back of the tongue and the jaw and right here a little narrowing. Make sure that's not part of it in an effort to compensate and try and get those vocal folds together. Yeah, keep it up for, for a vocal tremor, for a central tremor, because that's a medical condition that can be treatable. Right. And we oh, that right. Then right, 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 right. Right. The assumption is it isn't that. It's your traditional, what we call the old church lady vibrato. Carly, can I say one thing? I know we're running short on time from a surgeon's perspective. Yes, please. I like to operate. It's part of what I do. It's part of my training. I like to help individuals, however we do it, behaviorally, medically, or surgically, but I will caution 
individuals out there being advised for vocal fold injection augmentation or medialization procedures to push the vocal cords together, that that's going to be a quick fix to improve your voice. It very seldom is, especially in women, where we're not dealing with very thin vocal folds, we're really dealing with bottle insufficiency. I would say having done hundreds and hundreds of injections across the board for aging voice, I tell my patients, don't expect a magical turnaround in your single voice. These are static materials that we're putting into the vocal, vocal cords. They're not dynamic whatsoever. Particularly caution against calcium hydroxyapatite. Very stiff. I agree, well, I agree with like 100%. From a clinical standpoint, the results for the singing voice with any type of medialization is highly, highly unpredictable. There are instances when it can be helpful, but incredibly unpredictable. You need to go into it with that in mind. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, we're not going to get to all these, uh, everyone's wonderful questions and comments, but I do, I think this one's perfect to um, conclude with. Can Peggy and Dr. Uh, John start a Twitter account? <laughs> they have so much amazing information. <laughs> Share. First of all, call me Mike. Second of all, you'll find us on USC Voice Center Facebook page, or you'll find my email right on the USC website. So email me if you have any questions. <laughs> I just want to say one thing, and that is that the the effects of aging on the voice are a small price to pay for the privilege of living longer and being able to sing. I love that. I love it. Absolutely. Uh, Beautiful, beautiful way to, to bring us to a conclusion. And I can't thank you both enough for joining us tonight. And I want to remind everyone our next chat is January 15th um, with uh, Wendy LeBourne and Marcy uh, Rosenberg on kinesthesiology for the vocal athlete. So it'll kind of move us forward from this conversation tonight in some ways, I'm sure. So um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you, Mike. All right, thank you. And Peggy and Mike, if you'll stay on for just a minute and let our, our um, Nats chatters log off. And good night, everyone. Thank you for your phenomenal contribution tonight. Good night. Thank Happy you. Holidays.